Well, right. it, it kind of supports that whole collegiate calendar works out really well for these breaks. And then sometimes the coaches during the breaks are like, yeah, let's keep them engaged. But to reflect on Joe's point is they actually come back hungry for training and coaching. And during the breaks, they end up doing everything that we coach them to do anyways, because they're most of them aren't that creative. Like during when I was at Guelph uh, working collegiate and we would have down weeks and I'd be like, guys, I'm not posting the program. I would just post some rules essentially, like don't max out every day, that type of thing. They would be doing the exact same workouts that I would want them to do anyways, but maybe like an extra arms or something at the end. And then two weeks later or three weeks later, it was Christmas break or whatever the case may be. They're hungry to be coached and they like structure again, but yeah. close enough anyways. job justification, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I was telling Sam that in my, especially my youth athletes, most of them, the younger they are, the, the better they are. Of course, there's some natural developmental changes that have happened over the last five months with a lot of these young guys. But uh, the, as I was saying, the, the dendrites or something are thickening and the connections in the brain are consolidating somehow such that when they come back, with very minimal refreshment of the movement patterns, they're able to within two weeks, three weeks, return to what load they're at and then usually supersede those loads within four weeks. A hundred percent of them I found with the, uh, now I work with 13 to 17 year old group. So the adults for strength, not as much for Olympic lifts. Yes. For the complex power tasks, they return pretty close within four weeks, but strength, no strength. After four weeks, they're still at about a 10% deficit, 15% deficit on average. I want to be a kid again. It'd be cool if sport coaches got that. Mm -hmm. All right, Sam, or I guess Jordan's leading. Sam, I'll let you roll it. We ready to go? roll it. Go and roll it. Uh, well, we're going to do the updates first, right? So welcome guys. I'm Jordan Foley, uh, co-host Sam Crane and Trevor Cottrell. Today we're going to focus on kind of an international player uh, when compared to the Canadian system uh, for strength and conditioning or sport performance, whatever we want to call it. But first we're going to start off with our updates that we've been doing in the last few shows and we'll start off with the CSCA update. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. For those who don't know me, I'm Trevor Cottrell, Professor of Kinesiology and Health Promotion at Sheridan College. Um, represent the Canadian Strength Conditioning Association, which we call the CSCA, and I am the chair of the Education Committee, which has a very basic mandate at this time of creating content for education, continuing education for people who are subscribers of the uh, of the website. Uh, we're working towards some form of credentialing training, but more announcements of that coming up, but not a big deal. We've just had a lot of newsletter content come out. Most of the people on this are somehow involved in CSCA at some level. So I'm assuming you've seen um, uh, the newsletter information, three different articles on COVID, one on opening in the collegiate setting, one on opening in high performance setting, and one on training load management uh, that you can use and take to whoever your bosses may be if they're looking for guidelines on return to play. Um, then there's a variety, variety of other uh, articles. It's fairly well populated right now. It's, uh, I think we had about eight different articles that came out over a two week period. Uh, our fall newsletter will be out in October. The theme is pro sport. Last year we did a pro sport theme, but it's mostly hockey focused. Now we're gonna look at basketball, soccer, and then even go into corporate setting a little bit as well. Uh, I think we've got the lineup for that. And um, in the fall, we'll, there'll be some other surveys. We're going to be doing some credentialing surveys, seeing what you guys think of credentialing and what the need for it in Canada and what the critical learning is for people who are going to become credentialed in Canada. As well, there's going to be a survey on demographics coming out soon on uh, what are your jobs, who, who's doing what and where, and what you, how much money you're making, your training, that kind of background. And... Um, this is leading up to a planned annual general meeting end of October, early November. For those who want to be involved, it'll probably be loosely a um, small uh, roundtable format of uh, latest research and findings in our field or a little what we're calling the golden nuggets. So a variety of short shot talks. And then it'll be followed by a two hour annual general meeting where we'll lay out our plans for the next year. Uh, look at who's serving on the board, who's uh, 
has roles in the advisory committee and looking at basic, basic action plans for the next year. Uh, for those of you who aren't on the CSCA Instagram page, I invite you to do that. We're looking at expanding the articles there as well as moving into the other social media interfaces. So that's the update on the CSCA. Okay, I'm going to go next with the NSCA update. Um, as we mentioned last time, it's a CEU year, so try not to get caught by surprise with that when December rolls around and you need to do it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about, I'll pull my notes here, is this new certified performance and sports scientist that they came out with. They hosted a um, webinar, if you want to call it that, last week where they basically talked about the origins of that and where they think it's going. Um, I'll give you a few notes about it and then some thoughts based upon the mood and my interpretation of of way things were going. Essentially, um, what they did was looked at some of the international organizations um, in Australia, uh, bases in Britain and uh, SENZ in New Zealand, and, and tried to come up with a, almost like a terminal certification for practitioners in sports science. And um, I'm going to share my screen here because they had one pretty good graphic on there and it talks about some of the requirements. Uh, okay, uh, let me make this a bit bigger. Now, oh, it's not letting me. Essentially this, this graphic here, can you guys see the graphic? Uh, my screen's gone all wonky. They talked about this as the pathway, but ironically, they haven't really decided yet. So Eric McMahon was on there, he was leading it. Um, he's the director of coaching for the NSCA. They don't even know who they're gonna let sit for the exam yet. Um, and the requirements to sit for the exam are gonna be different depending on if you're an academic, if you are a practitioner, if you're an SNC, if you're an athletic therapist, all of these types of things. Um, so I thought that that was, that was pretty funny uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. But essentially what they were looking at was as an SNC coach, it was very heavily uh, inferred that you would need your RSCC. So if that's something that you don't have, your registered strength and conditioning coach credential um, or the RSCC with distinction, and you're looking at doing this certification, I, I'd recommend that you start um, doing that. And it, it can take a little bit of a while because you have to track down your employers for the last, for your whole career essentially to validate that you've been working full time as a strength and conditioning specialist. Um, now, a little bit of the commentary piece from, from what I've gathered uh, or what I gathered on that call and then some of the discussions that they have in the Facebook group. I think that the first year around, everybody that takes this exam and grieves the process is gonna get the certification. Um, like I said, this is commentary because they, it's, they haven't been able to validate the process. What they said that they wanted to do was to provide, you know, kind of a terminal type certification for people, but there are already people that are doing this job in the field, um, and have been doing it for a number of years. And I, I think they're going to run into, and that are already members and that are already certified members, just albeit in a different capacity with their CSCS most often. Um, is they're going to alienate those people if, if they can't get the accreditation, especially since they haven't actually decided how that's going to work. And, uh, you know, it's like six months away or eight months away from, from the first cohort. So, um, like I said, the information as far as being ready for that would be try to get your RSCC probably teed up and ready to go so that you could be part of one of those first sittings. And, and they're still saying that late winter, uh, early spring will be the release of the textbook that will be used for the CERT and uh, the first sittings of the exam to follow 90 days after the textbook is released. Why the premature release of the announcement of it uh, if they're so far off? Any indication that you just wanna give people an idea of how to get rolling if they need the RSCC or is it just completely bought? No, and, and they didn't really say that about the RSCC either. Like they kind of did, kind of didn't. Um, it was, yeah, it, it seemed like it was six to 12 months early and, and nobody really, I wasn't able to attend it live. And um, I decided that I didn't want to be uh, too arrogant about it and post it in the group of just saying like, hey, this, this is, 
this does not seem valid. Um, what are you going to do when people grieve it? I'm, I'm going to message him directly, Eric McMahon, and just ask and be like, yeah, this seems rushed. I don't really know. Maybe, uh, maybe somebody else knows about another certification that's in the hopper or something and, and they want it to be one of the first to market, that type of thing. But that's the impression that I'm getting because like the T's aren't crossed at all. Uh, the textbook's not available. They're not even saying what your credentials, education, experience have to be to be able to sit for the exam, uh, not alone actually, actually get it. What they did say was that the exam is final. So that was the only thing they were committal about. You had to pass the exam. If you fail the exam, no good, but we're not quite sure who we're gonna let take it yet. And obviously for you know those of us that know them, I'm thinking about people, people like um, Chris Dallison, potentially, Ian Warner, those guys um, that have been doing this job forever and might not be eligible to sit for it. They did mention about a master's, like they're thinking that it's, mandatory but maybe not and um, all the people on there were part of the sports science and technology uh, special interest group uh, and they were on this like 15 or 18 person task force essentially to come up with this and um, it was clear as mud so uh, if you want it I'd be locked and ready to go for the first first uh, cohort if I were you because after that I think it's gonna maybe be a little while before they run it again because I think it's gonna be messy I can't see how it won't be. I call bullshit on you fail it once you're out. NSA will never do that. Oh, no, no. no. Like what they kind of, they kind of said like you have to fail. You have to pass the exam. Like maybe, I don't know. Oh, like, I see. We'll so see. Yeah. yeah. Well, they'll take a rewrite. You pay 250 bucks. They'd love a rewrite. No problem. Yeah, for sure. Have you so, heard anything about the CSEP uh, human performance cert? Anybody involved with that at all? No, maybe Dave, Ben. No. Anyone? The last I heard with that one, actually, I, um, I was at a conference in February and they had a booth there and it was in Quebec City. This is kind of funny. It was in Quebec City. It was pretty cold and I forgot a chapstick and like they had free chapsticks at their booth. So anyways, I had to talk to the person. Um, and I guess they are considering, they had gum too, actually. So um, they are considering splitting them where like right now, uh, previously everybody that had CSEP got grandfathered and got the HPS. Uh, I think you have to go through some paperwork or something, but they, they are considering down the road being able to do just the HPS instead of um, having to do the CSEP as well, uh, CSEP CEP. But the person that was at the booth was unsure of timeline or if that would actually happen, but they have had a lot of people request for that. I know Murphy, you were saying that they ran a certain certification with the UK is that do you want to speak a bit on that and how that kind of went like you guys have something similar that was created and then not a whole lot of uptake is what you're saying um, yeah they have UK Australian Edition Association over here um, I think it was formed around 2006 or 2008 actually the Former head of performance services at CSIO was involved with that and um, Ray Taylor. He had some come input on on how they started off with that. Um, it became a lot more difficult to pass, I think, as the years went on with it. The pass rate how to become accredited is 25%. And they have that stated on their website. And their assessment is made up of um, four criteria. Uh, an exam, much like the CSCS, is the first element. Then you have a case study, which is three or six months um, on an athlete or team that you've worked with. And that goes into a lot of detail on, on what you did with them, the performance measurements you took, et cetera. And then there's an assessment and questions from, from uh, your assessors. Um, and you have practical elements, uh, speed, agility, metrics which is um, one that a lot of people fail actually just because you've got 20 minutes and you pick a, it used to be I think they've changed but you pick a video at random so it could be a 30 second clip of a tennis game and you pick, uh, you take an athlete through that for 20 minutes um, but a lot of people for the athlete in the clip 
as opposed to the person that they have in front of them. So a lot of people don't really understand the context. So I don't know if they've changed that since. And then the Was last one. The sports science one. What about the sports science one, Murph? Like the, the one you were saying that the, not the UKSCA, but the sports science manager and performance manager, kind of like what they're trying to do with the NSCA? Yeah, that's, that's the SS, the British Association of Sport and Exercise Scientists that Gordon was, was mentioning there, that the NSCA has looked into. Um, I was a member of them at one point. I, I know a guy, I worked with a guy who sat on their board and he's no longer involved. And he just said that, um, that their application to high performance was, and what, you know, application to high performance of what they were um, promoting wasn't, wasn't, wasn't related. So he, he decided that he didn't want to be involved with them anymore. The other thing about this too is that there's no um, necessity to have a basis accreditation in, in any of, of their of their elements or, or, or their certifications in order to work in you know, university institute setting or with a professional team in, in any capacity. So um, I think obviously the way the Australian Strength and Edition Association has gone is you're going to start to need require, your employer is going to require you to have ASCA level two in order to be an employee, but that's not the case here. So um, I think until this is, um, has that, level of authority, I'll never really get um, the level of people taking the certification that they probably had from the outset. Okay, we, um, we'll get back to you on that minute because that was not the way we were going. All good. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Sam, Sam and Brendan's fault. All good. Um, <laughs> we, we will get into that stuff. And if, if I forget, somebody remind me about the Canadian Sports Science Sports Medicine Practitioner Pathway because it's funny, that was based on bases. Um, U-Sport update, up next, Sam. Yeah, my bad. I thought I was gonna go in a bit of a different direction. I probably worded the question being correct. Uh, okay, so U-Sports, I mean, we're all kind of in a standstill still, but there are a couple interesting updates. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the there was an eligibility issue. I think we talked a little bit about it where they decided that in particular, football athletes were not allowed to participate next year if they aged out. And there was a massive appeal uh, in terms of uh, this age cap. And it looks like the appeal has been overruled. So that's probably a, a bit of a big change that there could be the potential that athletes that are over the age of 24 are going to be participating in football in the fall for next year. Um, different opinions on that for sure. It looks like that there is a bit of a legal battle as well in terms of the age cap in general, potentially just being completely removed based on uh, age discrimination. So that's some interesting legal stuff that's kind of going on at USPOR right now. In terms of the AUS, I mean, Elliot, you can probably speak a little bit more to it if I don't cover it, but really the major updates is that Acadia is kind of up and running, but only really servicing the community right now. They're looking to do indoor stuff September 8th. Dell, on the other hand, so what's really interesting here, and I think there's a couple schools in the OUA, uh, we'll get to that, Josh Ford's not on this call, but I think he might be in this situation, or maybe someone from Mac like Ben, but there's a variety of schools where they're, they've said, you absolutely cannot be on campus at all until January. So even if we have the potential to compete, which right now we still have the potential to compete for winter sports in the winter, you can't set foot on campus at all until January. So Dal is in that situation. They play in the same conference. So Acadia is going to be able to train with all of their teams in September, sport coach practice and lifting or SNC, while Dal isn't allowed to actually see their athletes in person until January. So that's quite interesting in terms of potentially, I would say, competitive advantage. Um, in terms of the OUA, we have a variety of schools. A couple of you guys talked about it earlier today that are actually opening indoors. So Ryerson looks to open Monday, this past Monday, uh, apparently. And then Brock is doing their soft opening next week with a full opening on the 24th, and that's indoors as well. Uh, I'm not really sure if there's anyone else that from any other school in the OUA. Uh, I didn't get much uh, feedback from those outside of that that is also opening indoors. Um, but if you are, uh, speak up here. That'd be great to hear who else is kind of getting in. Um, we're not, so at York, we haven't gone indoors yet. Uh, probably won't until September. Um, is there anyone else? Like, I don't think Josh is on here yet. 
no one from U of T, not really sure what U of T is doing, haven't got a whole lot of input from there, unless there's anyone on here from U of T. Yeah, I'm from U of T here. Um, we're doing some stuff on back campus, um, so that's just outside still, and then September 8th, I think we're planning to open up indoors. Nice. Yeah, so we have, uh, we actually have two facilities, so our Gold Ring Center and then our Athletic Center, and I think we're transitioning the Gold Ring Center to be just athletes for now. And then the, um, the athletic center to be more of a general population where all the rec classes will partake. Yeah, I heard that rumor that there's quite a few profs that are potentially upset with the fact that they won't have access to the Gold Ring Center. So there's a bit of a battle going on right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we just got an email the other day that indicated that York classes will be online in the winter. So I don't know about anyone else, but I think that's going to really affect a lot of our students getting that information now and not going to school. So um, who knows what that means down the rabbit hole, but still October 8th is the date that the, the U sport in general has to make the decision of whether winter sports are going on. In Can West, Joe, you can speak more to this, but really the update was that everything's still kind of status quo for training outdoors for most programs. Uh, not sure if Cole or Joe have had any changes. Maybe you guys wanna jump in here and say if there's been much in the last week or so. I know, Joe, you said you're no longer taking vacation because you're swamped. Yeah, we're not, um, yeah, it's more just, we're supposed to start in three weeks and it's still a shit show, but um, at least we're doing a lot of things, which is great, but it's again, we're not just limited by, um, like, uh, for example, Can West is mandating that uh, they'll make a decision on September 1st that we can only have seven people indoors at one given time. That doesn't include us as uh, strength and conditioning because um, it's dependent on your space. But like, so all of our court sports, for example, can only go um, one coach and six athletes. So like if you have a team of 18 and you have, um, you only get a two hour space to utilize your gym space, which is the case because we're limited on resources there. Um, they're scrambling to figure out how to get their athletes even to practice if that stays on in September. So we have the Can West guidelines, then we're going to get the U Sport guidelines, and we're going to also have our provincial guidelines. So it's a bit of a nightmare right now. Um, in terms of football, not much that I've heard. Um, we're probably only going to have about 45% of our team in the fall. Um, we've encouraged them to stay home and save about 10 grand since there's not going to be a season season um, where other sports have close to um, an extra eight to 10 athletes because we're honoring their scholarship. So if they lost a year last year, um, we're now having huge roster sizes, which is going to pose another issue. So it goes back to the aging out with the football. We're now going to have kids who are almost in their fifth or sixth year who would have normally been done and you've brought in a new crop so those are unique maybe to us I don't know if other people are in the same boat but it's a bit of um it's a bit of a gong show right now in that sense so we don't have a lot of direction from Ken West uh, at this time other than September 1st they're going to give us a update on whether we can increase those numbers from seven to even ten wild I haven't heard those I wonder where that's coming from like I haven't heard any of those type of restrictions um, I, I have no idea who came up with them. We're, we're okay outside. So I'm allowed to go outside with, um, a one on 10 ratio, but if I have an entire field, um, and I have another coach with me, I can go two on 20. So as long as we keep that one to 10 ratio. So like I've been consistently getting 20 athletes out, um, in a couple of the sessions, but we're mixing them. So I'm not just doing football only because we're just doing really general stuff and it's been I wish we could do this every year, um, but it's been really impactful to get this stuff out. And I think this year could really, I mean, if depending on which direction this organization goes on using it as an education tool, because I don't know about other schools too, like our therapy program will get cut a little bit if we don't have seasons. And I anticipate with a reduced amount of practice times and total volume with the lack of stress of being, on campus and everything else, we should see a huge reduction in injuries, which is we all know as SNC and sports science professionals that most coaches tend to do way too much. So I, I'm hoping that this really 
becomes a bit of an education piece where the sport coaches actually leverage us as coaches more mm -hmm. to ask, how do you manage this time? Yeah. So the last one is the RSEQ. And I'm not sure if you guys have much, uh, anyone has any contacts in the RSEQ. I've got a couple, but no SNC coaches in particular. So if anyone does, let us know so we can gather information from there. But in terms of football, like there was this interesting meme that came out and I'll send it to you guys. Uh, they are just have gone rogue. So Football Quebec has a group competition. High school and CJF are already practicing full contact. Universities are waiting on a decision from the school's presidents. They formed a committee with about six ADs and six MDs that are creating a recommendation report for the president. The sticking point is contact tracing and quarantine. So if an offensive lineman tests positive, who do you trace, right? The QB, who else, et cetera. Uh, they'll need to confirm two confirmed positives and two confirmed negatives before making a decision. So that alone would be six days. A positive test will be six days in fr on the front end, 14 quarantine, then six more days at the back end. It's a bit of a cluster, but the RSAQ is just, they're following football Quebec and they've essentially overturned whatever the government wants. It's kind of on their own. It's pretty wild. So, they're following the states. It sounds yeah, like. exactly. So we'll, we'll wait to see kind of what the fallout of that is, but uh, that's that's where they're going. So that's about it for the U Sport update. Um, we'll kick it back off to, to Jordan. Leave it to Quebec. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, essentially, what we wanted to do today was bring on practitioners that have uh, worked in Canada and in other countries. Um, and then obviously most of us are from Canada and have only worked in Canada. Uh, so I'll have them introduce themselves. And uh, guys, I want you to say where you're from, uh, where you've lived, if it's been other countries, and where you've worked as you know, a performance professional. I'll uh, queue you up each, each person so that we're not talking over each other. And then we'll get into the questions. Essentially what we want to tease out here is a lot of the advice and a lot of the ways that we build out our profession in Canada and the ways that we are perceived either by coaches, the general public, athletes, parents, et cetera, is based on information from other countries and predominantly the US or the US collegiate system. And we just want to better understand some of those uh, differences for people that actually have a way to compare it to uh, the way that we do things in Canada. So first off, we'll have uh, Cedric, if you want to introduce yourself again, where you're from, where you've lived and where you've worked. Sean, um, so thanks, thanks for the invitation to, to join this group. Um, so I'm from Australia, but my parents are both Swiss, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dual citizen. Um, so I left Australia when I was 19 to play um, rugby professionally in Scotland. So I played there for about seven years, uh, and then I got into the SNC um, side of things off the back of that. So first I was with um, Scottish rugby, um, first with the juniors, uh, the junior national team, and then the, the senior national team. Um, I moved to Ireland to work for Munster Rugby and then um, in between I also did an apprenticeship with Derek Hansen who at the time was with SFU. Um, so after Ireland I moved to, I got a job offer in the States to work for the Buffalo Sabres in the NHL and now I'm in the Dominican Republic um, coaching Olympic windsurfers so that's, uh, and, and I'm also working remotely for a company called Push who are based in Toronto. Very, very atypical, but a lot of good insight for us, I think. We'll yeah, pop around a bit. Yeah, that's great. Murphy? Yeah. Uh, hey, Mr. Heather, thanks for having me on, guys. So um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. Um, so I worked here for a bit um, and then moved to Canada in 2012. Um, firstly, Vancouver. And like Cedric, I spent time with Derek Hansen at, at Diamond Fraser University. And then after that, I took up a position with the Canadian Sports Institute Ontario in um, 2015 to work with Cycling Canada. And following there, I left in about 2018 to take up a role with Japan Cycling. I was in Japan back and forth for about 18 months, 20 months. And now I'm, I'm, I'm back in Northern Ireland and I'm working with a uh, the games here. Okay, I believe he's saying Northern Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, go next. Uh, yeah, it's like everyone, thanks for having me on. So I'm from the Republic of Ireland. So I did my master's and in internship in Ireland. I worked with Connacht Rugby. And then from there, I bounced across to Scotland where I was with the 
um, Scottish Rugby Academy and then moved on to uh, pro, uh, Professional Football Academy, so Hearts Football Club. And then I bounced over to Canada two and a half years ago. So a quick shout to Brendan Murphy and Trevor because they were two of my first points of contact after I got here and they helped a, a decent amount. And now I'm working with um, Athletics Canada after doing a few stints with various teams at CSIO. Awesome, thanks. You've turned up your accent a little bit there. You got your mates. After, after Brendan's, I had to really go for it, so I went for it. Um, Trevor's going to talk a little bit about the um, U.S. situation. Uh, won't have him introduce himself for the millionth time. But No, actually, I want to pass off to Joe, because Joe I actually talked to doing this, but Joe couldn't do it. So how about we throw Joe under the bus and say, Joe, you want to give your little background, because you probably have better insight than I do. Is that all right, Joe? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, the States is terrible. Um, I uh, so I I worked at Utah for ju just over two years, um, University of Utah. So um, w I was um, I started out in a um, as an intern, and I was set to do uh, become a GA. And um, uh, they had a staff turnaround, and I kind of got moved up a little quicker than normally. And um, so I worked there with primarily with football and men's basketball, and. Um, also worked with gymnastics, softball, and uh, the throwers a little bit, um, but mainly football and basketball were my two sports there. And then I came back to Canada, and um, so I'm Canadian, for those who don't know, and I uh, came back to Canada and started working for a Level 10 Fitness in North Van and um, started working with um, our high-performance athletes and then worked with Sailing Canada and um, the junior national team for rugby, uh, worked with um, snowboarding, so snowboarding, sailing, taekwondo, uh, you name it. So I worked with a bunch of wrestling, with a bunch of the national teams there, as well as um, just my private, like NHL, NFL, MLB uh, clients. And then I started at UBC about six years ago. Um, it, this The States is a machine. So I don't rate it high in terms of education and opportunity. Those that are excellent, it's more by what they've done and how they were developed from my experience. And I was, I had a very good, um, my, the strength coach I worked under um, was very supportive, very different than the guy that was there before Joe Ken. So, um, and not taking away from Joe being a good coach or not just different models of supporting um, their interns and their graduate students and so on and their, and their, um, uh, their assistants. So, um, I learned a lot of what not to do in that system because you have everything you need given to you versus the opposite of Canada, which is I'm a fundraiser as much as I am a coach. So, well, yeah. Thanks, Joe. And uh, our last panelist is, I always forget if it's Stefan or Stefan um, because of that video, uh, the Chopper Reed video, Stefan, if you can remember that. <laughs> It confuses me, but if you can introduce yourself next. Uh, for sure. It's a uh, state fan, but Steph works. Uh, yeah, uh, went to University of Waterloo, Kin. Uh, got lucky, Trevor Cottrell teaching, I think, Olympic lifting. I don't know. I can't remember why I took it, uh, but he kind of taught me the ways of smart training from the get-go and then uh, worked with different coaches individually. Uh, throughout my university, went to Cairo School in Toronto and did a sports specialty. And then now, uh, essentially I'm in China. Uh, I'm working with one of the provinces, Guangxi province, it's a Southern province, uh, as the director of rehab. So we've got 23 Olympic summer sports that we train here, about a thousand athletes. And uh, actually because of, you know, all the shit that's going on, I'm also directing the the performance coaching or strength and conditioning uh, for the next month. So that's, that's a fun little add on for me, but uh, yeah. So my, my point of views will be a little bit different uh, coming more from the therapy angle and the return to play angle. Awesome. Thanks buddy. Um, obviously we're, we're already running short on time, so I will combine some of the questions along the way. Um, if somebody jumps in from, you know, your country already, uh, that you've worked and, and kind of ticks it off. Don't, don't feel the need to jump in as well. So the, the first thing um, we'll start off with is just what's the history of the profession in one of the countries that you've worked in? Uh, 
I'll go if you guys want. Yeah. Um, it's new. I think we need to realize that this is still, I know the NSCA started in the 60s, I think the late 60s with Boyd Epley, but professionally, it probably started uh, like where coaches were actually getting paid a decent wage um, in the uh, probably the mid 90s, I would guess, like especially in the States. So like in Canada was really non-existent at the time. You had a few outliers here and there that were doing something. But for the most part in the States, those coaches that were hired were ex-players um, who kind of started this whole where we are now um, or they were um, – they kind of just were in the right place at the right time. And I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus because there's a lot of great coaches, but um, it was more, we just needed people to do it. And we realized, Hey, if you work out, you're going to get better. Um, despite it being driven by either power lifters, Olympic lifters or bodybuilder types. Um, it, it was very narrow focused at the time. So um, it was really rare that you saw coaches that kind of encompassed everything. And you can see that it's modified and it's changed over the time, but I would still say it's quite archaic um, in the States and it's more driven by the football coach or the basketball coach than it is by performance. And it's created a problem across the board because, you know, if you're going to talk about certifications, all those guys that have killed kids all probably had their NSCA. Um, and it comes down to the fact that their jobs were contingent on whether the sport coach likes them or not. And that's part of the reason I left was, and why I didn't kind of take a job back with Urban Meyer at Utah was, it's not about performance. It's about just uh, crushing the kids and being the whistleblower and the disciplinarian versus like actually making athletes better. So like when you can recruit at Alabama, your job is irrelevant as a strength and conditioning coach because you're getting the biggest freaks of nature in the world. But if you're at a smaller school, you actually have to work to get there. But if you don't have the support of that head coach, you can't do anything anyway. So it's a bit of a tough balance in the States. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, th and that's the reason why we want to do these comparisons because if we try to do what they did, it's not going to work because our culture is not the same here in Canada. Can we get one of the guys to jump in from the UK? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of speak to a little bit about um, kind of, you know, what I learned when I started working in Scotland. So <clears throat> obviously pretty, you know, very, very tightly associated with the UK, UK SCA. Um, in Scotland, it would have started with, um, with a guy called Ken McEwen, um, who is based out of Scottish rugby. Um, Jill Stevenson then kind of had the offshoot to, to, to be involved with the UK SCA as well. But really what kind of made the big shift in the, um, in the, in the landscape there was Mike Stone. Um, moving across to take over the University of Edinburgh's um, sports science degree um, or department. So he actually kind of set things up in the, in, um, as like the first formal kind of education hub for S&C in Scotland. Um, so, you know, the, the sports science um, or the applied sports science <laughs> degree, there is still that kind of powerhouse in terms of education in Scotland. And it's also where, um, you know, most of the current Scottish coaches would have cut their teeth um, you know, in terms of education. And then, um, you know, Gary, I'm sure can speak to it too. A lot of the coaches from the Scottish rugby kind of setups and the Scottish Institute setups will also have come from, um, from that, from that course. So that's, that's a little bit of a background of how it kind of worked in Scotland. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, Gary or, or Murph, um, from the Ireland perspective. Um, so from like Republic side, the main offshoot of the whole SNC was, just University of Limerick where I did my course and then Satanta College is probably the most famous college now in terms of creating graduates for strength and conditioning. Um, a lot of guys would go from, it initially was PE courses and then it turned into sports science and then the sports science turned into masters in strength and conditioning and pretty much like here everyone's got different titles and it's different levels but it's really recent I would say. Um, like there's not a huge amount of history and it's just I guess because it's a small enough place as well and then you're looking at opportunities and a lot of guys know more than most of us here is you'll get your qualifications, but then to actually get opportunities, you have to leave the country and go elsewhere. So um, the big guys are kind of the Liam Hennessy at Satanta College and I can't remember his name. He worked out of UCD and UL, um, but they kind of led the charge and they would still be leading the charge from that side. 
Probably means Tom, Tom Cummins. Yeah, and Tom, Cummins, Tom Cummins and you out. Yeah. And then, yeah. oh, I can't, I can't remember his name. Um, yeah, there's a couple. It'll come to me. It's great for you international guys that we love hiring these, uh, love hiring internationals in Canada. You guys can get educated over there and come over and get any job you want. It's pretty easy to get a visa too. At this, well, it was anyway, so it helps a lot. Good. Um, actually, we'll slide into the credentialing next. Um, you know, what's the history of credentialing, and and what's your experience with that in the countries they've worked in? And I actually want to start off with uh, staff. What's the credentialing that you're looking for, coaches? Yeah. Do you have many domestic employees there? Are they mostly expats? Because um, I feel like you might have uh, run the gamut there. Yeah, with China, it's a, I call it the Wild West. Like uh, when you guys are saying that stuff is new there, like we're literally like founding the ground. Like there's nothing here, no standards. So essentially everything's based off of the other countries. Uh, China's a big money-making machine. So everything's kind of based also on good companies. So the NSCA were probably one of the first ones to come here to kind of try to sell their products and cr credentials to people here. But uh, the level of education on performance coaching is extremely low. They'd be similar to the States, what Joe was talking about, where you just try to beat the guys down as hard and as fast as possible over and over again. And uh, credential-wise, there's actually nothing. There's no legal precedent or anything in China that you need to have. So you can show up as like a homeless guy from the States, make it into the States, become a teacher, and then decide, hey, I'm going to be a professional coach, and then try to start it up. Uh, but yeah, so essentially right now they're basing it off of NSCA or the Australian standards. Um, and finally, for most of the national teams, they use EXOs. Uh, that's like their primary training learning method is the EXOs paradigm that they use. Uh, in interesting on that. Um, Murph, did you want to continue on now while you're talking about certification and maybe you, you already explained it pretty well, but uh, what you or any of the other UK guys know about why did that, why did that arise? Um, was there a gap and kind of was that gap between the NSCA and the UK? It wasn't specific enough, good enough. Um, some thoughts on that. I, I, I'm not really sure. Um, what was born out of other than, you know, Cedric's comment with Mike Stone and, and Gail Stevenson. There's a couple of other guys in there too. Um, Clive Brewer, um, I think he's with the US soccer team now, um, former, former certification. I, I, can't, I can't think of a reason why, um, or no, I don't know of a reason why they founded the certification or, or how it, it gained action or gained legs um, specifically, but um, it definitely has grown and it seems fairly um, progressive. Um, and uh, what Steph was talking about there in China, they're, they're trying to work it so, um, I guess, the same level of, of NSCA, ASCA that it becomes a, a mandatory prerequisite for employment. Um, I would say there was a, a big part to play from UK sport there, which I guess is similar to on the podium, but they, they branch more into sporting organizations um, as well. So there probably was a push from that. Um, and I think probably Cedric could comment on too, the boom in the SNC um, credentialing and, and, and it is a, as a profession in Australia, it probably happened in the UK a little bit later where you had a lot of guys from Australia coming over who had you know, worked for a couple of cycles of Olympics quite successfully in, in either rowing or cycling or whatever, and then migrating to UK and, and working their way into the Olympic system there, or, and then into pro sport, which seems to um, have happened for a lot of those guys. So I think it was probably like Canada, there was a recognition that there needs to be something. And then with the migration of, of Australian um, professionals coming in, you know, they, they realized that, that something needed to be in place to actually differentiate between um, you know, your, your personal trainer versus somebody who, who has gone through a legitimate um, period of, of experience and, and um, study. Just to piggyback on that, so the, the interesting thing with the UKCA, and I, I haven't followed it because I don't follow it anymore, but I think even there now, 
talking about completely changing their process. So Anthony Turner, who you see publishes a lot of papers, is now one of the top guys there, and Chris Bishop. I think they're changing their whole process as well. Because um, I know, like, as as someone who can attest to Brennan's, I failed my plyometrics in my UKSCA, <laughs> like a lot of people. And they changed that probably a couple of months later, and I think they're changing it again. And then to piggyback on the bases side of things, because, again, proud member of bases and got my accreditation they we did ours when i was at the sports academy because whether they've actually enforced it but they they were making it mandatory for sports scientists with any profession with a premier league soccer team had to be based as accredited um so our boss in the academy slash sports science department figured that that would then start leveling down to say Division one teams or Scottish Premiership, etc. But that hasn't happened. Um, and the basis is just like, it, again, like Brendan was saying, it's a case study. Um, it's pretty comprehensive and from a case study perspective, but it, it doesn't seem to be part from that Premier League requirement. And even then it says, um, have or be willing to get kind of job. Um, <laughs> that like you see in a lot of positions. So I don't think it ever kicked off from that stage with bases on the UK SCA from my experience was just, it was always uh, a definite requirement for any job in the UK. In Ireland, it's not. They usually put it as a desirable. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, just the thing about that was, and, and part, going back to what I said about bases earlier on, and part of the problems that the UK SEA had was as well is that if you had, if you had a, a job posting for a position, you know, um, if you had an intern, for example, who you know, didn't have that, maybe had the academic qualifications and also had interned with you for a number of years, it was probably more likely that they were going to modify the jobs back to have attained within six months this credential. Yeah. So you, know, you have a lot of people who have just graduated from university that are, are either going for bases or UK SCA. Instead of actually trying to get some experience and get in, in that way, and they're quite expensive, these certifications too. You actually do have a lot of people who do have these certifications but aren't you know, looking in terms of of, of job opportunities just because you know, they aren't in um, a position to intern or whatever. And then this is the other problem is there's been a really um, big issue here in the UK and it's sort of smacked me in the face whenever I move back here is how much of a problem interning for free is and what teams expect um, from interns. So, you know, you have um, postings of people looking four or five years professional experience for an intern with a you know a, a professional soccer team, what have you, which is just which is just ludicrous. But the problem is it's not going to end because people will still apply for these positions, even though there's no financial, there's no you know, there's no remuneration for it, I and mean, they're just expected to do that until somebody else leaves or whatever. Race so it's, the ball, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a vicious cycle, and it's it's very difficult to get it right, but. No UK SEA yeah, are, are, are trying to push to, to try to get it and couple, want it moving in the right direction. A couple of things I want to try to tie this to, together a little bit and to see where it goes. But one of them is um, quickly, there's a guy named Mark Watts that used to write articles. I don't know if he does still on Elite FTS and talked about the lack of an objective, reliable way to uh, evaluate strength and conditioning coaches. And if we don't have that and we don't agree on that, it's a race to the bottom, right? There's, there's plenty of people out there with the same credentials or close to it on papers. Anybody here has, uh, except for the fancy PhD guys, and they're willing to do the job for free. And the people that are deciding, they don't really know the difference between them anyways. So that's, that's what it becomes. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up next and see if it shakes anything out of the trees with the international scene is when I was still at CSIO, um, and I'm not necessarily gonna pick on anybody, to um, talk about this that works from them now, unless it's public knowledge. I know that's very kind of me, but they were coming up with something called, uh, it was the Cops and Network and Own the Podium uh, as a partnership called the Canadian Sports Science Sports Medicine Practitioner Pathway, I believe. And what was gonna happen was as of a certain date, like 2020 or 2021, I don't know what's happen happening with it now, that Schedule A funds, so funds from Own the Podium that were for uh, IST essentially, could not be spent on practitioners that didn't have this credential. Um, and I was told at the time when I was an employee, well, as was everyone else in a meeting, that we would be grandfathered in to have that credential. 
And I asked the question, um, and it's ironic because I'm not there anymore, but I said, what if I don't work here anymore? Like I can't have contracts with national teams because I become less competent if I don't work here over time. And that was met with not really an answer. Um, I'm not sure if they're still exploring that, but that's, that's the only way that you can really control these certification um, demands and, and make them mandatory is that you can control where the money can be spent. It'll be interesting to see if they still follow through on that and what some of the bigger sports that have options do if, if they choose, like a Hockey Canada would be a very good example. Um, obviously, I don't think they take them on the podium money anymore, actually, but even some of the sports where they could just use their Schedule A on may, maybe just therapy and uh, out from there. But are you aware of anything failed with that? Like, was it mandatory initially in any of these other countries? Or, or Steph, do you guys uh, mandate where money can be spent and who it can be spent on? Or do sports get to decide? Crickets, all good. I can literally hear crickets in the background, actually. Uh, well, so in China, uh, the system's quite different, state run. So um, <laughs> it's everyone gets paid, uh, yes. but not everyone gets paid well. Uh, generally speaking, if you're coming in as a foreign expert, so an expat of any kind, um, you will get paid 20 times more money. And, but you will essentially have to like service them 24 um, seven. So, but there's no standard, like it, it's really based off of kind of what Joe's saying is like the coach or the, what we call the leader, the leaders will decide what, you're going to do for that team in that specific season and they might change on and off. Uh, if I give an example, my PC worked a nine to five job and had to train 10 people. And then another PC had to train, I think it was like 60 people and they worked uh, 14 hour days. So, and they got paid the exact same. So there's no like who gets money or, anything like that and then it's based off who likes who so there's like in terms of like certification if the things work here it's all based off of if they like you they will keep you around if they don't like you if you cause trouble they will not have you around so uh, not too similar to canada but they actually admit they're communist um, maybe anyways more honest here i guess <laughs> I just had a quick question um, about in China. I mean, is there any kind of um, like mentorship model, or is there any kind of like mentorship structure that, that's that, that, that's that's within the um, within the system? Okay, hold up one second because that's where I was going next. Sweet. Cedric, All right. maybe you up, Cedric. Um, talk about talk about internship or mentorship models. So obviously, those are those could be the same thing, but they're often different. So internship internship models. Uh, and the existence and availability of mentorship to actually help young coaches or aspiring coaches get to where they want to be uh, within the systems that you've worked in. And since Cedric queued it up, we can start off with Steph. All right, right on. Uh, so internship model is big here. Uh, there's classes of school. So there's a tier one school like Beijing Sports University where they will learn something that would be at most equivalent to like a art degree kin. And then there's lower level tiers, I think down to, I think it's three tiers, but then they will learn how to do aerobic step classes and jump rope as their performance training. And uh, so it's very varied in that sense. And how education works for the locals is you essentially learn from the teacher that teaches you. So there are some very good teachers who've learned from foreigners who've done really good work. And those people end up being really good coaches, but there's a lot of old guys that haven't learned anything new from what they've done and they will teach their ways. So there's no standardization in that internship process, but there's lots of internships. Like uh, for me, I have 30 interns that follow me around and they essentially just got lucky in terms that they had a foreign expert teach them versus a local doctor who just does one type of massage. Uh, and then in terms of mentorship, that doesn't exist. Uh, like unless if it's just a personal connection, there's no formal way to get mentored at all. It's all 
if anything happens, it's through the higher level tier schools and it's a teacher kind of just hooking you up with a friend and it's like, oh, I know a guy, give me a little money and I can get you set up with him kind of thing. But there's unfortunately no mentorship at all here, which is a big flaw. And a lot of guys don't learn much because of that. Can I ask Joe to go next, um, just in contrast to probably what the UK guys are going to say, because that's the internship and mentorship model that we hear a lot about, or we did hear a lot about five to 10 years ago in Canada. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I'm um, a bit of a contrarian when it comes to this, because I think part of the issue is um, there is no right way to do this job. And it's every one of us has the same title and does completely different shit, but we all seem to do okay with it. Right. So um, where, when it comes down to say internships, um, there is issues inherently around that, meaning, um, in the States, you're a rented mule. Um, if you're an intern, you're doing water, you're cleaning the bathrooms, you're doing terrible work, unless you get a really good coach. So that's the average there. We're here. Um, we're not necessarily as litigious as the States, but if someone wants to pry into like our internship programs and saying that these kids are doing work that they should be getting paid for, we could all be screwed. Um, my mentorship in the States was very different than my mentorship here. Um, it's, it's very narrow focus there. So it's very different than like the, you know, like the Eastern block uh, model. Like I, um, we have a guy who works with our rowing hub, for example, and, so he's an exercise physiologist and you know when he went to school in Poland you start in a general master's program and then for him he knew he was going to go he wanted to go into rowing they go into general like water sports and then they go into specific whether you're rowing canoe kayak sailing whatever it happens to be but they slowly narrow the focus over the course of their time and in that time they spend time learning from other coaches um a guy used to work for me here was in Cirque du Soleil for eight years and he has his master's from in Kazakhstan in acrobatics. But like his first week of his master's program, the throwing coach from the university taught him how to hold a shot put for a week. So it's very different mentorship because a lot of the, um, the coaches uh, in different countries have such a wealth of experience um, that you can just gain more from it. And they're actually um, layered into the educational system instead of it being a certification process so like your master's actually does what it should be intended to do is get you ready to be work ready where ours is just checking off boxes to say you've completed the bare minimum to say you're a kinesiologist or a coach um, so some some internship programs um, do a lot of education a lot of hands-on uh, work in Canada and in the States and others it's literally you're just filling up water and handing out towels so like a lot of the pro teams are doing the same thing they approach us asking for interns and I ask what that entails and I rarely send my kids to it unless they're doing a really good job with developing these young coaches because we're seeing kids apply for jobs and if it comes down to someone who has say their CSCS and someone who has like internship experience, I'm going to go to the person who has internship experience. Um, that's me personally, but I mean, it, it's, we can talk on this forever because there's so many factors that go into play when we're doing this because a lot of private gyms do internships as well, which is all personal training, which I think is really valuable for, you need to learn the business side of things. You need to learn the bedside manner and you need to learn how to interact with people. And um, there's value in it, but, it's it doesn't have enough of a well-rounded approach so you're just doing active rehab or you're just doing personal training so like there's so much to cover within the umbrella of s and c or performance that um it's hard to get actual direction for these young people coming through that's ironic eh? like we a couple of the big concepts that we try to apply in our coaching now most of us anyways i hope is evidence-based practice and athlete centered or individual centered or whatever. And a lot of internship programs don't use either of those. Well, it's you know. funny, we tell them, like we're giving them all this information of how to be a better coach, but we're not using the same methods to make them a better coach. You know, like if we tell our athletes that we want them to figure things out on their own to become a better athlete, 
why would being an intern be any different? If we just provide them with all the information, it doesn't matter. We're full of uh, kids who are really good at sport trivia instead of actually practical coaches. And that's where my concern layers into all of this is that we have to be, we have to probably have a united front of what are important aspects to know as this level of a strength coach or personal trainer. And as you work your way up the chain, these are the skill sets that you probably should have some level of. And if you don't, you need to know how to network to get people who are better at that area that you suck in to round out your team. And I don't think we talk about this enough uh, in the performance industry. No, for sure. Uh, can we get one of the handsome guys from the UK to jump in here? Am I not handsome? What, what the fuck? I did say that, man. You, you made that up. So it is interesting to, you know, what, what Joe said is totally right. I mean, you know, it's kind of like everything is kind of a luck of the draw. Like, you know, if you end up with a really great mentor um, or someone to learn from, then sweet. And if you don't, then that's just kind of how it is. There's no, apart from, I guess, like an ASCA model where a mentorship kind of structure is in place and there are certain kind of standards that, you know, mentors need to meet and then you have to kind of work your way through stages and through levels. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I don't think that's in place in the UK with the UK SCA just now. And I'm, almost, well, I'm certain that it's not with the NSCA. Um, so it's just really interesting how, I mean, Joe's completely right, that kind of standardizing some kind of like base, um, you know, base ability doesn't really seem to exist apart from like one or two examples in the other models. But it's very, um, it's very ad hoc. And again, like, you know, everyone knows what a good carpenter or a good plumber is, but it's really hard to define what a good S and C coach is. And that's almost what you have to define first before kind of figuring out, um, you know, what standards are required to, to basically let people go through the stages kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a mixed bag in the UK here. I mean, I'll give him, you know, my personal experience versus what anecdotally I've seen out there. I mean, um, where I did my undergrad, um, just outside Manchester in England, um, we had a really good professor there. They called Steve Atkins, and he was actively working with um, with uh, super super league rugby team there and um, a professional a professional soccer teams. So we got the opportunity to go in there, and it was more sports science as opposed to strength and conditioning work. But also at that university, and um, you have John Keeley as well, who's who's affiliated with a lot of clubs there. So I wouldn't say it's it's a renowned university for sports science or strength and conditioning. But the practical elements that you get based on a, who who your professors are and B, who they're connected with in, in the local area means that there's a lot of opportunities for you there. So I, I did get good opportunities coming out of undergrad with that. The other aspect as well, Cedric talks about the UK SEA, one of one of their elements there is a case study. As I said, it's it's six months, I think, that you have had to provide information of how you've worked with a, a team or athletes. So I went through that before um, I moved to Canada. I went through that in 2011, I think. Um, and that is actually one of the really difficult elements for people to pass because um, it's more so to do with the assessor that you get on your first time around might be different than the next one and, and they may pick different things that's wrong with your case study. But at least that's a representation of you spending an applied critical thinking six months with a team or an athlete and then them judging whether the decisions you made and, and the things that you tried to achieve were and um, what if they were up to standard for, for what they expect for the, for the accreditation so i guess when i moved to canada um i felt that a, a lot of sort of um intern experience um but whenever i spent time with Derek hansen and sfu it was it was almost like you know the matrix you, you the red pill or whatever it was an eye-opener so i think if there is a, a, some sort of certification, there has to be some sort of assessment of what has that person done over the last number of months to bring them to this point, and are they, um, are they fit for accreditation? The NSEA doesn't have that practice because you just get your, your undergrad degree and then you set the exam, or at least with the UKSA, you have to spend some time working and actually coaching with a team or group of athletes, and then show how you've uh, started with that and how you, what your end point has been, what you've learned, what you would do differently, 
at least there's a critical thinking element to it and you know there's six months of, of work that's done there and something to show for it but i do think there still needs to be an extension of that based on my own experience of of actually seeing how it's done at a higher level and how it's applied and you know you know working with one athlete in a case study versus working with 300 athletes in a university setting or whatever it happens to be is, is a totally different kettle of fish and you can't apply the same principles to one group as you can the other so i think that there needs to nearly be a, a tertiary element of you have your baseline knowledge because i think that's really important you have some experience of application and outcome and critical thinking and then the tertiary of actually seeing how um, it goes into actual practice as opposed to your own little controlled petri dish that you've you've, you've spent that time working on I don't have anything to actually add to that, but just have to say I have to go because I have another session coming up. But thanks for having me on, guys, and all the best. Take it easy. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, thanks. Gary. Thank you. Take it. Um, because we are we are getting there on time, I'm actually going to try to wrap another few things in. And and keep in mind that um, keep in mind how you think that this could help us and give us some advice as well with what we're trying to form up in Canada. The next thing I wanted to ask you about to combine a few questions is. What's been your experience and then also your, the experience that you've seen of others as far as trying to build out a professional, sustainable career where you could have a life if you chose, you could have a family, you could get paid, um, you know, enough to have a comfortable life and, and what that looks like. Is it, is it based on competence through the way or is it mostly hoping that you hooked your wagon to somebody good? Isn't there, there's an adage about that, right? Uh, it's uh, who you coached with or coached under, right? So by proxy, you're a good coach if you work for this coach. And that's, as we're seeing online, some of the people are getting hired, have no pedigree whatsoever, but they work for someone. And it's, again, it goes more into niche markets. So like, if you look at baseball, for example, you know, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with driveline, but one of my first undergrad coaches is now with driveline. He went to the Mariners and now with driveline, those guys were getting picked up left, right, and center. And they're like two years out of school by MLB teams because driveline brought in something novel and like they're doing some really cool stuff, but some of it is really old school and rudimentary. So there is a bit of an issue with the, it goes back to that pathway. And I think, one thing that is very different than the UK is you're actually getting taught uh, and Australia, I would say too, where you're actually getting taught by professionals. So people who have either worked in the industry have coached um, or just happen to be really good where here it's like you fluke out. If you get a good professor at one of the major universities, who's actually ever been involved in sport. My, my assistant Tavis is one of the brightest kids out there that I've ever met. And he stopped doing his MSc because he asked the, his, um, his um, supervisor how much like crossover he has with athletics. And the guy's like, I've been here 17 years and I haven't even stepped foot in their office. Right. So like there's a disconnect there where like we're starting to build on that. But I think where we could be really impactful with certifications is if we have the ability to be a sessional instructor and start teaching practical courses which I was slated to do last May, where they're actually going to work out. Their lab was in the actual varsity gym. Um, we could start building more robust uh, kids coming through the programs versus they get uh, a three-hour lab on how to squat deadlifting clean, which is what currently happens at a lot of schools here. Yeah, I mean, I really agree with Joe there too. I mean, I guess an extension of that is... I guess, placing a major emphasis on making sure that, you know, our coaches are well-rounded, not just in terms of kind of understanding how to coach in different disciplines and, um, you know, training different qualities, but also all the, the kind of professional responsibility stuff that comes with being an S&C coach, especially at a high level, you know, whether it be, you know, budget management or, you know, communication methods with, um, with higher ups or, you know, kind of multidisciplinary uh, networks that, you know, most of us do have to work in um, when you're working in, in, in these kind of sports that we do, that we work with. So I, th I think from, um, you know, from a structural perspective, kind of placing a huge emphasis on that, that well-roundedness and creating those well-rounded individuals is really, really important. It gives them the best chance to survive, I guess. 
Steph, what are you guys seeing with people, whether they're contractors or employees over there, as far as being able to sustain it, um, longevity, et cetera? Longevity is a big, uh, a big issue here. You get, you can get, you can get pushed out pretty quick. I was going to say to that, to kind of all their points, but the biggest issue I've seen here is you have, you're, you're held accountable to your stakeholders, to the people that are deciding if what you're doing is worth, worth it. Um, I think in Canada, I took for granted that strength and conditioning was just a given that like people did strength and conditioning. And what I've realized coming here is that it's not a given. Uh, I have actually had very in, intense conversations with coaches, swim coaches, especially where there's like this performance training, they call it performance coaching here. Uh, it does nothing good for them and that they actually argue that it makes everything worse for their athletes. It tightens them up. They get slower. They don't do any better. They get hurt more. So there's this element of showing the proof of your work. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things that I would suggest is coming up with good outcome measures to your work. Uh, how are you actually tracking the progress of your athletes and ensuring that it makes sense to your stakeholders. So if it's a coach, do they understand, do they understand what you're doing and why, and you should be able to adapt to what they want to see. Like, uh, for me, I'll have one coach who just wants to see that they're doing powerful things, even though like for a weightlifter, they're doing powerful lifting all the time. And then they want the performance coach to do more powerful lifting and may, may not make sense to the performance coach at the time, but you have to make sure that you can communicate properly with that person so that they want you there and they can see the value and then you can build that trust and then eventually maybe give them the better programming that you think they, they require. But that's the biggest thing in terms of longevity is just being able to prove your work. Um, I think a lot of people are really smart. A lot of people have masters and PhDs that haven't actually done any work, like you said. So if you can prove that you can actually do shit, good things will happen. I have a follow up question to that, Diesel. What, um, this might be a really like naive question, but in terms of access to information, like it's pretty locked down in China in terms of what you can access and what you can't access and from my limited knowledge, but in terms of being able to provide the, the information from like research articles or, you know, what people have done in the past is that really limited to be able to gain access to that information and then all probably the translation into a language that can be read like is that part of the problem yeah access to information is a major issue uh they they get these books uh they it's like this thick like every couple months and it's the chinese research and strength and conditioning and rehab and it's all local research. Um, and to be clear, local research could be, I treated four people and I noticed when I did, I made them do a jump two times before I got them to do a squat that they squatted heavier and therefore I published it. And now it's in the research that jumping two times is makes you stronger. Uh, it's very low methodology here. So the information getting to the coaches is based mostly off of companies. So like Exos is a really good example. They just decided, well, we'll just teach you what we know and you'll follow our system and don't worry about any of the extra information. So a lot of the national team coaches are, I, I would say almost all of them that are locals are trained through Exos at this point. So it's like the companies that make money are who are educating these people. So there's a huge gap in knowledge. That's wild. Wow. Interesting. The, so, I think the biggest gap is in coach education, like sport coach education, not having a clue what we do, right? Like a lot of the issue isn't necessarily around any of us having a certification or education. It's around a coach um, that doesn't understand something as simple as progressive overload. And this isn't unique to Canadian sports. This is, the world like just talking about swimming there I was laughing to myself because our national team isn't much different it's all about volume and you know like if they understand progressive overload then this doesn't become an issue but they're all in a hurry to get stuff sorted out as fast as possible and 
there isn't really a pathway yet for sport coaches to understand that. So I inject myself on the interview panels when we hire new coaches. And I always ask them like, what do you know about S and C or basic needs of physiology for your sport? And if their answer is that's your job, it's a huge red flag. And I'll just support that because that means we're not going to be able to align because you have no clue what whether your sport is aerobic in nature or mixed or power, whatever it happens to be. And that's why we've gotten into trouble because a lot of this stuff is still um, what our predecessors have done before. Like there's still people doing 300 yard shuttles for football. Like that should have been figured out 20 years ago that it's an alactic sport, but we're still getting it done. And this is from major D1 sports teams as an example across the border so i think sport coach education needs to be tied into this on some level and that could be a, a potential offering for us to do something that no one else has done which kind of you know we could even leverage our grad assistants to do like a little sport analysis like a jan lemur type uh, one pager like you need to understand that if your sport is this in nature you might not need to crush them for nine weeks to get them to where your desired effect is. So it, it might be useful for us to actually create a certification that's specific to sport coaches and maybe even therapists so that they have an understanding of what the actual needs are. So Joe, a lot of that does exist actually and the, and the gap is in accountability from administrators. So if you like any of these um, jobs, you typically need coaching certification. If you go through NCCP in competition development, I believe it is, it might be introduction. So like level two, level three type stuff from the old school. Um, there are modules called developing athletic abilities, um, advanced sport planning or something like that. And, and it's pretty good. Like I've done them. It's just, they, they claim it's competency based, but then at the end of the day, we all end up working with these coaches where you're like, how the, like, how the fuck do you not know that? Like, that's unbelievable. It, it, it's actually something that I am considering looking at um, in a PhD down the road, uh, essentially the failure of competency-based education. Like, what, where's the gap where all of these people have actually been through a competency-based system, but don't demonstrate any of the competencies in their coaching? And, and not to like, not to actually um, bullet hole anybody, but just where where is the gap because you're 100 right but any of the university coaches or even national team coaches that i've worked with they a lot of them they don't know that stuff but they're like level four level five coaches some of them even been through the old nci out west or advanced coaching diploma and they legit don't know what energy system their sport uh takes so that's place. the flaw in the system jordan like we understand the language that's being used as S and C professionals, but the sport coaches don't have a fucking clue about their basic needs of their sport. They don't understand skill acquisition. They, there's a big disconnect. They think watching YouTube videos is education of what Kobe did for their basketball team. So there's something to be said around understanding the difference between drills and skills, but they don't have a understanding of um, cueing or anything like that. For, I'm not saying everybody, right? I'm just, but maybe the language is incorrect in what we're de delivering to them. So they don't understand that. Yeah. I think that that's, uh, that's something that we should definitely look into for the sake of time, uh, guys and girls, I'm going to wrap it there. Uh, thanks. Thanks to our guests, Joe, Steph, um, looking around Cedric, Gary, he's gone. Don't need to thank him. And Brendan, uh, for your for your guys' input, and I, I think there's a lot of takeaways there as far as points of reflection for us, as far as recommendations that we take forward to the CSCA, and then also things that we can all implement in our practice. Um, because uh, looking at how things have gone, whether they're successes or failures in other places, are great learning experiences for us as well. And obviously, um, we weren't there, so we couldn't have learned those things. So thanks for bringing all those things forward. Anything from Sam and Trev as we wrap up? I think it's interesting to note that um, our industry is so young that no country seems to have figured out much <laughs> in the big picture. They, none of them really have a good model. None of them has a model that's working. None of them have really great career paths. So I guess in some way that's encouraging that 
we're not that far off, even though we're just starting out in Canada in many ways. Sam, anything? I just wanted to thank you for being on at 1 a.m. in the morning, 1.30 a.m. Really appreciate that uh, dedication to have this discussion. And I don't know anything that goes on over there. So that information is so interesting to me in particular. So let's not go backwards. That's, I think that's what teaches it, but what that teaches us. He's on call 24 seven. He doesn't sleep anyway. <laughs> no, no, I got, I got one of the cushy jobs. Don't you worry. <laughs> don't you worry. Milking it. Yeah. I thought you'd be back already, but you must be doing something right. I thought you'd be coming. Or, or you can't get out because he doesn't have his passport. So, well, yeah. Or they're holding one of his kidneys hostage. Oh, I <laughs> shouldn't have said that. Just one? Just one? That's all. They're so far ahead of us there, they don't even need kidneys. I bet you they got it all figured out. <laughs> they, they say they have everything figured out. That's for sure. Interesting. So, uh, don't, but yeah. it, I did, I did want to say, though, if in terms of like the youngins trying to learn, Although there's no mentorship here, um, there's jobs here. Like there's an obscene amount of jobs for, especially for strength and conditioning. Um, every team, every pro team, every national developmental, everything. They, they, because a leader at some point said, every team needs a PC, a SNC, like everyone will have one. You, they, you may not get used and it may be just like in America where you might do a lot of bullshit, but uh, there are jobs here and for the foreigners you do get paid decently well compared to to other places so um, Sam maybe or Trevor I'll, I'll send you guys some some contacts here if anyone's interested in coming out this right. way obviously that, that won't happen anytime soon but you know, maybe in the next decade right we should put Mandarin courses into my curriculum I think so. I can help you out there. Every time, Jeff, every time you say leader, I just think of that Simpsons episode from like 20 Yeah. That's my theme song. Oh, you goofballs. Right.